All right, welcome to the Rowan Resource Podcast. This is Travis Gardner, and my guest today is Justin Farina, a high school phys ed teacher by trade. Justin is also an elite indoor rower with multiple podium finishes at the World Indoor Rowing Championships. Having found rowing through CrossFit, Justin's success and experience has come without any exposure to the on the water aspect of our sport. In this episode, we're gonna explore Justin's journey in the sport and his unique perspective he can share about training as an earthbound high performance rower. Justin, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Travis, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Definitely. Appreciate it. You know, I've been, uh, you know, as we we're kind of talking talk about before, I'm pretty excited to have this conversation. I've been, I've been wanting to kind of connect with someone like yourself that's kind of reached a, a very high level of kind of performance in the sports without any influence of the on the water side of, of rowing. And I think that, uh, you know, for this podcast, certainly having been coming from the on the water side, that's kind of dominant, dominant <clears throat> in my perspective, but mm -hmm. um, anybody kind of with their eyes open realizes that the on the water side of rowing has, has, definitely become a minority in terms of the participation in the sport, you know, and there's so many people, certainly the, the core of the growth of the sport is coming through things like CrossFit, you know, and the kind of the prevalence yeah, of, sure. the, of the indoor rower. And then I was talking with Bruce Smith with Hydro after this last episode and certainly, you know, bringing new ways to get that indoor rower experience out to the public. Um, you know, it's, it's really exploding and growing. And so um, I'm kind of, I'm curious about kind of for you, you know, and kind of the evolution of, of finding the sport through CrossFit, I believe, was, was yep. your initial exposure, kind of finding it through CrossFit and kind of the kind of the information that's available and the resources that are available for those athletes and kind of how you developed and, and got what you needed, you know, as a rower to kind of to, to understand how to take good rowing strokes and to kind of train, you know, effectively without the one benefit that I think comes from the on the water side is that there's there's professional opportunities for coaches in mm -hmm. on the water rowing, whereas they're not in indoor rowing. So you're therefore going to get a kind of a, a more experienced level of instruction there. Yeah. Um, that's not kind of available to that CrossFit population. And so, so yeah, I'm so, you know, kind of where, where do you find that? Cause you know, just watching your videos, it's clear that, you know, you've got some good foundational technique there. Um, well, I got my first, I started CrossFit in 2005 mm -hmm. and I bought my first, uh concept two rower in 2008 used from someone like an hour away for what like 800 bucks at the time and at that point it was like sweet i have something to row calories on now mm -hmm. um during workouts and it was like that for you know probably two or three years um maybe even longer where it was like it was in the garage it was something i used occasionally I didn't pay attention to numbers other than like calories or um, time or whatever. So I didn't understand the power of that monitor. I didn't understand how to necessarily row efficiently. And at, at that time, I, I didn't really care. I was just worried about, you know, finish times and workouts and what have you. Um, it took a while. It took till like, gosh, I think it was like maybe 2015. So it's going back like five years now. And, um, thanks to the internet and thanks to a lot of athletes in the CrossFit realm getting more popular and putting out their training stuff and more people diving into it from outside sources. Cam Nickel, who was an Olympian from, uh, the, from uh, Great Britain, um, he put out something called Rowing Wad. And at that time, I think he was working with Sarah Sigmund's daughter, who's a top end female athlete. And, um, it was, it was free at the time and he was, she used it in his coaching and um, it was rowing focused to help, you know, develop her, her engine or aerobic capacity or whatever. Um, I was like, well, this looks interesting. I'll check this out. And it was, I think three workouts a week. Um, the first one was 20 minutes for max distance. Okay. That's fine. Uh, I took two breaks during it. Uh, I think my finishing split was like 156 or 155 or something. It was miserable. And I, I hadn't, I hadn't rode that long. I don't think maybe one other time I rode a 10 K two years previous, but, um, after that using the, the numbers and him sort of talking about, you know, understanding this, uh, this concept of using stroke rate to control your pace. I was like, what does that mean? And then obviously noticing, oh, strokes per minute, that's in the top corner. That's what that means. So I was really like, I was really new to, to, uh, to the terminology and, and how to use that information to improve uh, my rowing. 
so I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try this for six weeks. I'm going to see what happens. And I learned about rate I learned about how to control splits using rate. I learned how to adjust pressure um, on top of that. And there was just, there was so much, there's so many details that I was completely unaware of when it came to rowing. And the end result was, um, obviously I developed way more control on the rowing machine. My capacity improved. Um, and I saw transfer into at the time, which is, I was doing CrossFit a lot. I saw transfer into my ability to pace more effectively in CrossFit workouts. Cause all of a sudden, um, I have a better understanding of how I feel um, at different levels of output based on the numbers I'm seeing on the monitor. So um, at that point, I was like really hooked with, um, with what rowing could provide for me in the CrossFit space. From there, um, I started to get, you know, just, just posting screenshots and whatnot of screens. I got, um, I got into the world of like indoor rowing specifically where, wow, there's this whole community of people who just row yeah. um, kind of semi-competitively online and realized, okay, I have some somewhat decent times compared to some people. And, and so rowing went from like three days a week as a complement to CrossFit to maybe four or five days a week as more of a focus. And then um, I think I was about sub 630 for a 2K about a, maybe less than a year into this as it's sort of shifted mm-hmm. um, and got into the cross team challenge and jumped on board with uh, fitness matters and started to get a sense of, um, you know, different training methods and uh, different pacing techniques and different programming ideas and stuff. And, and it just sort of blossomed from there. So that was me as an athlete. Now as a coach, um, I saw this as like, oh, I gotta, I need to teach people this. Like there's more to rowing than, cause I have a lot of friends that did CrossFit that were that just like me, they didn't use the monitor for, you know, what it's designed to be used for. So, you know, I was bringing a few people into the garage and showing them like, Hey, this is your stroke rate. You should pay attention to this Yeah, and things like that. Um, and we had, I guess this was right around the time where I had to shift um, training people in person to training people online. Third baby came, things were getting busier. Um, but it was really like my coaching in this world was a few people in person and that sort of grew. And then we kind of had to shut the doors of that and then switching kind of to, to online. And it sort of just blossomed from, from that point. So, um, yeah, I was, I was literally a newbie to the rower and then, um, you know, became very much hooked on, on indoor rowing, uh, and into, into coaching as well. Yeah. And with that transition, I mean, I, th- uh, Clearly, a lot of coaches these days are, are being forced to make that transition for for uh, for not for the third kid, you know, reason. Um, but yeah. uh, you know, what's uh, you know, what was kind of you do you find was your success in terms of being able to kind of bring people into that and to kind of develop those relationships, you know, through the virtual kind of you know what worked and what didn't. Um, um the I think the key with, for me when it really took off was when I. I started to sort of adapt what I had been learning and doing on the rowing machine to the ski erg and, and making that sort of connection to like, okay, I kind of got a, a decent idea of, you know, how we can program and build progressions towards different distances on the rowing machine. You know, how does that look in a completely different sort of movement pattern um, with different sort of different, not different data, but like stroke rates are very different, but, um, the same, the same monitor, same numbers. How can we shift to to the skier? So, you had a lot of people that um, either were crossfitters that rode, and you know wanted to learn how to ski more effectively, um, and you know a lot of people in the indoor rowing world who are Concept Two fans that also wanted to you know dive into skier training, and then obviously from there to the biker. But that was really the shift to. Uh, um, where I think I saw more people kind of looking for info. Um, I also wanted to kind of get, I didn't like what I was seeing in the skier realm in terms of technique. Um, obviously in rowing, 
there should be some similar patterns from indoor to on the water. Obviously, there are some differences you can get away with on the rowing machine that you can't get right. in a boat with oars. Um, but in, you know, in, in the CrossFit world with ski erging, very little looked like cross-country skiing. Mm. And that was like, a, this doesn't make sense. Like, why are people moving so differently than what this machine is likely designed for? And, um, you know, so trying to push sort of a, a new way to look at it or really a more appropriate way to look at it um, definitely turned some heads. And, and I started to have more conversations with more people in that world about, um, you know, how training might, should look or what technique should look like. And then obviously um, when people got into it and started following some, some programming and plans and workouts and saw improvement, um, that's when, you know, numbers grew and, and things took off. Now, in terms of, you know, from the cross CrossFit side and, and talk to other CrossFit athletes in China, you know, what's been kind of the conversation like in terms of saying, hey, you know, this is more than just, you know, uh, you know, kind of a calorie machine, you know, and sitting there. Because I, I certainly know, you know, I've talked to CrossFit people and kind of floated to some of the places in, in my area of like, hey, you know, you know, if, if you guys need some any kind of consulting and kind of work coming in or even just working with the mm -hmm. coaches to say, how can we teach this more effectively, the stroke to, to reduce injury and then clearly in, improve performance. Um, and not a lot of interest there, you know, and, and I, I don't know if it's just kind of, there's, you know, there's certainly a, a somewhat a contentious relationship between on the water rowers and indoor and CrossFit rowers, mainly because of the pretentiousness, I would say of the on the water community. But, um, but, you know, I, I'm curious there and kind of what, what kind of rings true, you know, in terms of trying to kind of bridge that gap and kind of bring the community together. Well, I think they can look at, they can look at the weightlifting community for mm -hmm. starters, like uh, early days CrossFit people were not moving well with a barbell and weightlifters were disgusted. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, fast forward a few years and weightlifting coaches getting into the community, like, Hey, we have a group of people that are really interested in the sport. Yeah. We should help them. And if you watch high end competitions now, people move very well in weightlifting. They're putting up great numbers. You have a lot of CrossFitters moving into, um, the weightlifting world fairly easily as a stepping stone and being competitive, um, you know, at, at meets. Um, Tia Claire Toomey was at the Olympics, you know, in that sport. There was a lot of good coaches in the community. Um, Shane Farmer through Dark Horse has been huge in that world um, and has, you know, has a very good channel and a lot of informative videos um, for CrossFitters. And he's, he's been around for, for years now. Yeah. Um, and I think I would assume there's a lot more CrossFitters attempting rowing Definitely. simply because CrossFit tends to be um, a jumping off point to a lot of, uh, you know, focused sports, indoor rowing in my case, um, weightlifting in other people's cases. And you have a lot of endurance coaches getting in, um, uh, Hinshaw with aerobic capacity, um, bringing in, you know, the longer endurance work and swimming and stuff like that. Um, I think it was easy early on to sort of look at CrossFit as a really, you know, big group of high intensity, bad movers, and then see that group sort of branch out into these individual sports, looking to get better at those things to then in turn improve in CrossFit. And I think the sports need to see that as, Hey, this is a great group of people to lead into our sports. And you'd hope that because of exposure to the sport in CrossFit, where you otherwise might not get exposure to that sport, would lend itself to more people um, participating, those parents sending their kids into, you know, weightlifting camps or rowing camps or whatever um, that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. So it's an opportunity for, um, for a relationship to be built, that's for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's there's no doubt that you know the people doing CrossFit aren't kind of aren't casual about it. You know, there's no. there's a lot of passion there, and so if the rowing community can draw on that passion to kind of augment their ranks, you know, for the people that are interested in exploring that aspect more, I think you know that absolutely I think you got it right. Um, you know, in terms of, and I'm curious in terms of the training methodology, and, and for me, you know, there's you know. I've been using my own channel to kind of talk a lot about kind of, you know, the philosophies and, and try to kind of inform the, the public about that particular way. But um, by no means do I think that, uh, 
that kind of the methodology that I that I talk, which is more of a volume to speed, is is what kind of people in the rowing world talk about. Um, you know, there's a lot of people even within rowing that will kind of advocate, you know, away from that volume to speed of, you know, really focusing on the aerobic capacity and then kind of shifting toward competition to tuning that, that uh, are sharpening that knife. Um, you know, there's, unfortunately, you know, a lot of kind of just the communities rowing are kind of proprietary about that information. And so you kind of just get glimpsed, you know, I get glimpsed of like, you know, the Danish national teams, and they definitely don't, you know, train in those high volume. There's a lot of kind of, you know, high intensity interval work. Um, you know, I suspect kind of the Italian method is very different from that kind of than, than the American method, but I don't know the details there. So it's kind of like a lot of kind of, you know, recognizing that there's a lot of, there's different methodologies out there that are working, but not really being able to kind of grasp and understand them. And I think that with the, with the anaerobic side and, and, and doing a lot of kind of, I would say threshold work and above, which would be similar to like a Kenyan distance running, um, you know, methodology. Um, I see a lot of people kind of tending toward that and gravitating toward that in rowing, but I don't think that the, 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 the secret has been revealed into kind of how to balance that appropriately, you know, but in kind of mm -hmm. watching, watching your work through your social media at garage athletes, you know, clearly, you know, your, the approach and the methodology you have it is kind of much more uh, toward what I would perceive like a, a Kenyan distance runner to be using. So a lot more kind of threshold, a lot more interval type work. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious about that methodology and, and just if you can kind of talk a little bit about kind of what are the kind of the building blocks of your training and kind of how do you approach it to kind of achieve, achieve your performance goals, you know, for a run. Sure. Well, what's, what's unique about our situation is, um, you know, we're trying to balance multiple ergs, road bike, ski, um, across multiple, you know, time and energy domains to be kind of ready for a lot of virtual competitions throughout the year. Mm. Um, so where, you know, if you're a competitive rower and you're only focused on, you know, one distance or one race, your training can be very specific to that purpose, right? Um, but if we're training for a competition like Road Royalty, which is a four week um, virtual competition on the indoor rower, where events could be a 500 meter time trial up to you know a half marathon where the first 2000 meters counts as its own race, those are difficult to yeah, see. There you go. <laughs> Those are difficult to like plan very specific training progressions towards. Um, and if you look at what competitions tend to be like, if you've ever kind of seen what a lot of events are like, mm -hmm. um, there's very few easy ones. Like they're all very hard thresholdy sort of mixed interval workouts mm -hmm. where like, for an example, there's um, one that's been used a few times a thousand meter rest two minutes, 750 rest a minute, 30, 500 meter rest one minute, 250, where total time counts, thousand meter time counts and 250 meter time counts. So to be able to sort of map your output based on, okay, I need to be fast at the start. I don't have a lot of recovery. I need to manage that, um, you know, manage that intensity through the middle so I can hit a very fast finish and sort of balance all that to try and score well across, you know, three scoring opportunities. Um, again, can you map a progression for that and then know that, you know, a week later you have to do a 12 K where the first six K is scored separately than the last six K. So it's really, really challenging and um, throw the skier on top of that or the biker. And now we have to really think about, okay, how do we balance intensity for a lot of people doing a lot of different competitions throughout the year? Um, our program's not complicated. It's simple. We have um, sort of a year map looking at trying to peak for various different distances at different times of the year while simultaneously, um, you know, progressing towards a different distance on a different erg that kind of complements the other one. Okay. Um, so if we were gonna row, like right now, our rowing focus has been on uh, 
towards a 30 minute time trial. And the skier group's about to start into 1K training. Um, and there, one's kind of ending while the other one's starting. And um, so mapping that is, is kind of the, the trickiest thing and trying to make it you know, accessible to a lot of people. The majority of people that I work with are people like me that have ergs in their garage, have kids at home and a job and are just gonna you know, try and work out four or five times a week and want some simple structure to follow. So um, balancing intensity and managing that is has what sort of my focus has has become lately um, trying to do a little bit more longer steadier aerobic work and kind of having that be at least half of the person's week and then depending on um, their training situation the current training cycle and obviously their schedule having some options with various degrees of intensity um, that they can sort of select from. So people have a lot of, a lot of options. Like every yeah. week they might, and just rowing alone, they might have a choice of eight or nine different workouts with various intensity levels. And within each one, they'll have options in terms of volume and pacing um, based on their current abilities, based on the kind of time they have. So um, as much as we try to train for specific time trials and competitions, um, our biggest thing is, is trying to balance intensity, um, you know, to try and help as many people as possible follow something with, with some structure. That gotcha. makes sense. Yeah. I've got a lot of questions coming out of that because there's, you know, a lot sure. of fun things, you know, one, I, de I, I don't want, this won't be my first, but I definitely want to come back to those competitions. Cause I, I love that, that very tactical nature of it. That that's my, my brain, my brain is very happy, you know, and things like that. And trying to just think while you're talking about kind of, okay, that thousand meter 750, where, where am I going to pace to, to max out on those? Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I'm curious in terms of, in the training and kind of where, how you're balancing kind of in the, in the micro cycle, you know, I talked to a lot of my athletes about kind of the, you know, you have your loading, I call them loading days and unloading days, you know, and just kind of really kind of making sure that you're um, not considering just kind of those longer, slower days as your unloading days that, you know, unloading is really time not stressing the body. And, yeah. and when, when you're putting out those workouts, you know, whether it's three days a week or, or four or five days a week, you know, how, you know, how does that, how are you planning kind of that unloading that, that kind of rest to work and what do you consider rest? Is it just kind of like focusing on the family and work and not training that day? Is it, is it, is it just kind of a light recovery efforts, you know, kind of, how do you kind of balance those two, you know, load, unload, load, unload, you know, when you're um, doing so many kind of interval, you know? Um, yeah. Unloads. Well, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm probably right now I'm, I'm just rowing. Like that's my only focus mm -hmm. and I'm on it at least five or six days a week. Sundays has kind of been become my day where definitely don't row. I usually, you know, work out with, with my seven year old son. Um, and we're, you know, playing around in the garage doing various things. Um, and I know I'm good for, you know, maybe two high intensity days a week. And this is just kind of what I have found personally that I can manage and have good output and not hate life. Yeah. Um, and then from there, it's, I really do a lot by feel because like, again, I'm not training for, for necessarily anything specific. Um, within our training cycle, we usually have two or three sort of focus sessions that in terms of pace and volume are working towards a specific goal. Um, I'm trying to get at least two of those done every week. And then I sort of fill in the rest with either, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling beat up and it's still a training day, I won't take it off. I'll usually hang out around, you know, like a 30 to 45 minute, 70% of heart rate sort of effort. Um, on days I feel like pushing it a little bit more, but you know, aren't really going super hard. Um, those are when I like to do tempo sessions, whether it be, um, you know, maintaining consistent rate and pace. Don't really care about heart rate that much, but it's at, you know, a, a split I can handle. Um, or if I'm doing like a higher heart rate, sort of just um, controlled 80 to 85% and just sort of work up to that and then hold that regardless of pace. Um, you know, that's usually going to be 
two of my training days, one or two easy ones, and then, you know, two, two really hard ones. And that'll shift depending on obviously what our focus is at the, at the time. And, and you kind of mentioned heart rate and heart rate, you know, kind of on, on my personal channel is kind of where, you know, I'll, I think a, the channel really exploded when I started talking about it, you know, and for, for me, I'm, I, I'm a big, big proponent of, especially less experienced athletes, not uh, using heart rate in terms of determining training zones, uh, you know, and it particularly because it's so different from individual to individual and a lot mm -hmm. of liter a lot of literature out there tries to make it seem like everybody should be in this percentage range or, or sure. these actual values, which is even worse. Um, and so, you know, I, I've talked so much in trying to kind of communicate what the training zones feel like. And then, you know, I, I advocate reverse engineering each individual's heart rate, you know, because it's different. And I, yeah. I think the biggest thing too, with that, when I talk to athletes is that there's, there's significant overlap between the training zones. It's not, there's not sure. a hard line between, you know, at this number, you're at this zone and that number, you're at that zone. And, and the books definitely don't say that. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm curious in terms of, you know, with your experience, because you were talking about kind of that heart rate, is that, you know, how, is that something that you kind of developed, you know, where does it play in terms of determining, you know, how hard you're going on each session and kind of what, what just kind of feedback are you getting from that data point in your training? I've, I've been using it enough, you know, for a long enough period of time where I, I know how I feel and what the heart rate is showing me. I have a decent understanding of that relationship. Um, so I trust those values to sort of guide my efforts. Um, I've never had a session, you know, in the last, probably in the last year where I've tried to hold at a specific heart rate range and didn't have a matching sort of feedback in terms of feel from my body. So, you know, that's taken a while to, to understand and to not be afraid of certain numbers that pop up on the screen because i think um if you're not familiar with heart rate training and all of a sudden you see 92 percent of max you know, oh no oh, that's not good yeah you know? um and but i early on if i didn't have it on and i started to feel certain things i just i didn't understand how i was feeling to the level of intensity to my speed it's taking a long time to sort of build that relationship and i try and tell people that like if you're going to invest in a heart rate monitor and that's something you want to track be patient with it you mm -hmm. need to sort of get an understanding of how you're going to feel based on a, a certain session and what numbers are going to you're going to see as a result of that yeah um and just develop that relationship because you know 80 percent to me might feel a lot harder for someone else yeah. versus 70%. Um, and that is very individual. Um, our ranges that, or at least that I use, um, are standard in a lot of models um, in terms of, you know, zone one to five, um, where I kind of give people a, a big gap or range based on them on that particular day. You might be somewhere between 70 and 80% today. Um, if you want to hang out lower or higher, or if you tend to run better higher, that's fine. This is the volume. This is kind of roughly where you should be pace wise. Mm -hmm. If your heart rate's in that range, great. Um, if you don't want to focus on that, you just want to focus on pace and it's more of a tempo session, that's fine too. This is maybe where you will be. Um, and that's not for everyone and not everyone follows heart rate training. That's fine. Again, I'm just, I want to give people, um, a decent window of, you know, for this particular session, for this particular level of intensity, let's say it's just 45 minutes at steady state, um, you know, what should you be aiming for? This window or this, you know, these values, this data might be different for me than for you, um, but this is roughly where you'd be. And for most people, most people sort of fall comfortably in that range. We have a few outliers um, you know, there are people that regardless of what they're doing, they're running really hot. Yeah. That's just how they are. Um, and they need to sort of ignore those numbers and go more my feel than somebody else. Yeah. And I've seen that a lot too, is, is people it's, it's very few people I've talked with that run low, but there's a lot of people that run high. And I think when those people then encounter the 
heart rate training, they tend to lose just a lot of opportunity and potential because they're constantly under training and trying, and they yep. get a lot of frustrated. And I've had athletes that tend to run hot um, in my high school groups that have gone on to college and the college coaches happens to be kind of in a, in a heart rate fad and, and kind of is trying to force them into extremely low heart rates where they're essentially, it's like a, a slow jog or a fast walk, you know, type of intensity yeah. for them to, to be holding it. And so, yeah, you know, people me, need to understand, like, it's a tool that you can use mm -hmm. that might not work for everyone. I think right. it's, it's interesting for a lot of people to see what those numbers are like relative to others. But again, like, as you said, you can't just rely on it because um, some people think it's the most important thing in the world. Yeah. And then also, I'm, I'm curious about your perception of how you guys, how you've used drag factor. Um, and I, I've had conversation on this and, and the rowing world is very, has a very kind of fixed idea of drag factor to the point where it's uh, most rowers use the same drag for everything that they do. And, uh, you know, kind of having spent significant amount of time training on the bike and kind of, you know, having that kind of, kind of shape kind of my understanding of that the resistance and that damper setting as as like mm -hmm. gearing in the training you know i've kind of learned and kind of experimented with a lot developed my own system for using that that drag factor and kind of adjusting it based on the the zones but the the factor remains that for on the water rowing that damper is going to be extremely important for what you're using on an indoor rower because if you've got it if you're constantly training too high you're not going to develop the quickness that you need to then go onto the water because on the water you're using, you know, water as your leverage point, the water's moving. And if you're not able to move quicker than the water, you're not going to move your boat. And then in rowing for on the water rowing, that's when you get a lot of athletes that may perform very well in the erg relative to what they're doing on the water. But, you know, certainly for you and the, in the indoor rowing side, you don't have that, that consideration of, Oh, you've constantly got to develop that leg quickness. That's going to be necessary for when you get into a boat. And so I'm curious kind of what you've learned along the way in terms of, of, of kind of adjusting that, that damper setting to get the drag factor and how that has changed based on, or do you change it based on the workout that you're trying to do on any given day or the distance that you're going to be doing in, in one of the virtual championships? So, I feel like I'm still learning about it and I've learned a lot from you and in watching your videos. Um, it's gone from, you know, Hey, what do you use? Let's try that. <laughs> yeah. and, um, oh, you know, this national team uses this for their tests. Okay. Well, let's try that yeah. to, you know, trying to be a little bit more flexible with it and experimenting with different, with different settings. Um, we've gotten to the point where, um, I change mine a lot more than I used to. I used to be like, oh, I use this for everything. Doesn't matter the distance for the training session yeah. where um, I'm, you know, I'm going a lot lower than I ever have, like down towards 110. And really at this point, no higher than, than 130 or 135. But um, whenever we do shorter, um, shorter intervals where our focus is, is mainly trying to develop stroke power, I'll have people bump it up you know, a factor of 10 to 20, whatever is comfortable to them, if they want. Um, and, you know, trying to, you know, tell people to maybe experiment with lower settings than you're used to, especially if people come in from CrossFit, where it's just, you know, cranker to 10, yeah. let's go. Especially yeah. if it's on calories, if it's on 10, you get calories faster. So there's a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of weird things that people don't understand. Um, you know, it's good to, it's good to learn it. Talking to a buddy of mine from, uh, who's a rower in New Zealand where they go down fairly low and work high rate just to work on quickness, but that's obviously specific to their sport. But yeah. I think even being on a rowing machine and if you want to develop some higher rate capacity, turn the damper down a little bit, mm -hmm. work on that, that timing and that technique at higher rate. Um, I think the biggest thing with people is when they see numbers change on the screen, they attribute it to, Oh, I, I went lower today on my on my drag factor and i'm producing the same numbers i don't like that I'm just going to go back to where it's comfortable people need to kind of get out of their own head yeah. and try things um i've certainly enjoyed sort of being more flexible with it and trying different settings depending on the distance and and even on the day not committing to okay it's time trial day 120 you know during warm-ups playing with the range a little bit and seeing where i feel most comfortable where i feel most efficient and then just sort of just sort of leaving it. Um, I don't have a giant range. I'm definitely not cranking it. And I'm definitely not bottoming it out, but um, I've at least gone from being stuck on one number 
to being way more flexible with, you know, depending on what the session is and trying to get people to, you know, we're doing short intervals a day, bump it up a bit. We're doing yeah. longer, steadier session. You lower it down and don't worry too much about uh, your numbers right now. Just try and get a feel or a rhythm. And for you, when you're, when you're going, so you're between a 110 range and a 130, 135, kind of what, uh, you know, what workouts are you using for each end of that range and kind of in the middle? Um, so right now, just thinking of currently, um, in any of my kind of longer tempo days, I've mm -hmm. been down, you know, 110 to 115. So, you know, 30 minutes trying to hold rate 30 for 30 minutes you know, keeping the, the, the drag factor down and just focusing on consistency and holding that same split. Um, recovery days, same thing, down a lot lower, at a lower rate. Um, that's more focused on, you know, on heart rate on that day. Um, for a lot of our, um, you know, mid intervals, so we've been doing a lot of three minute intervals recently. Um, that's been at sort of my standard 120. Um, we did a series of um, rate capped sort of middle distance efforts recently, started at 6K. And then after three weeks, we bumped to 5K and then uh, 3K, 2,500, now we're into 2Ks. The first week at 22 strokes a minute, second week at 24, third week at 26. And we finished those off with some really short sprints. And that's where we've bumped the damper up a bit. So if I'm doing like this week, I did 2000 meters at 22 strokes a minute, about a 10 minute rest, and then a, a six by 150s. Um, and I went from, you know, my drag being at 120 for the 2K up to 128 uh, for the sprints. I've never enjoyed heavy drag sprints. I know a lot of people are like, if you're doing a 500, why don't you just crank that thing? Why? Well, it's not comfortable. I don't feel fast, I don't feel efficient. Yeah. Um, so 128, you know, 130 for me feels thick enough. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that, or I can still uh, maintain, you know, I feel like I have good connection can still produce good numbers. I've never felt comfortable higher. Some people do. Some people prefer and feel better up you know, 140, 150 or more. And that's fine. But, you know, personally, that's where I've been. Yeah. And I've, I've had an interesting journey lately because, you know, uh, up until probably about a year ago, you know, my in terms of competitive, it was all on the water distances. And so it was that typical mm. 2000 meter focus. And, um, you know, and when I was training for that, you know, there was a, a range. And so I would say my range, you know, was typically a general around you know, all the way down to 80, even some 75 sometimes when I was trying, when I was either just getting back into a, a training cycle or for my UT2, you know, but settle in usually around 85 for UT2, um, though I'm more around 100 now. Um, and then I would race at 118 and then maybe I would get up to maybe 122 for some sort of transport workout and some training. But, and, you know, when I came back in and trying to compete on the indoor rower and I was going for the sprint distances, cause I was, you know, realizing that, Hey, I could just hop on it and set some records here. It was interesting in trying to kind of break out of that middle distance training, uh, you know, way of thinking that, uh, that the 2000 meter is and really, and fortunately, having come from a track and field background, I, I, you know, rowing is so fixated on one distance or on the mm -hmm. water rowing is it's, it's really, um, it's unfortunate. And it, it really is a huge blind spot for people in the sport because they don't understand the differences between training for different, uh, different durations of racing, whereas in track and field, it's natural. It's, uh, you know, kind of, well, you know, 200 meter would never train anywhere thing like an 800 meter runner who would never train anything like, you know, right. a, a two miler. Um, and so kind of looking at that and, and trying to reapproach it and drag was part of it too. And kind of finding kind of what, where that drags and where it kind of felt efficient and just how different it changed. I know for, I mean, for the hundred meter, it was just, you want as much kind of damper as you can. And so it was kind of up in that 220 range, you know, I found for the, for the one minute, um, I experimented a lot actually for the one minute, cause that's where I was actually training. The 100 was just kind of a, a um, afterthought, um, and I kind of experiment anywhere from kind of that normal, like 118, 120, you know, and went up to 180 in terms of drag. And I actually, I found that 160 kind of, you know, gave me the most kind of, you know, kind of torque on it without kind of, you know, fatiguing the legs where it felt heavy. So I could still feel fast. Uh, actually, you know, the difference between a, min a minute and 
you know, 500 meter for me is only about 20 seconds or so, but I would definitely not use that for one minute or for the 500. It's amazing kind of the difference just that 20 seconds makes. And I would definitely kind of go really probably close to where I, I would be for 2000 meters if I was doing a 500, maybe, maybe 125, 130 at the most. Um, and then I think anything a thousand meters above, I, I'd be sticking in that kind of 118. Um, but, but yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting journey and kind of exploring and kind of finding kind of what, what provides that, that feeling that you're getting that, you know, that torque, that resistance and that yeah. load without making the drive feel sluggish, you know, so that I can still kind of yeah. pop and accelerate. Um, and it's been fun. It's been a fun kind of journey because, you know, for me kind of learning is as, as much fun as that kind of performance and kind of trying to, to reimagine kind of how to train for the one minute, which is corollary to the 400 meter you know, long sprint and track um, sure. and the training for the four hundred doesn't look anything like even the 800, you know, everything yeah. from the 800 up to like the two miles and above is, is very similar. The difference is very small compared to even going from 800 to, uh, to the 400. So it's been interesting and trying to kind of re rethink how to train that anaerobic. And, and I laugh with my girlfriend. It's like, you know, for me, you know, a workout, their volume, maybe a thousand meters, you know, I might be getting a thousand meters of volume in the workout, you know, split up into maybe 250 or 300 meter um, durations, or maybe even if I'm doing 100, 120, 130 meter intervals that are just extremely fast. And it's the feeling, I mean, it's far more intense than I would do if I was doing maybe like a, a four to six by 500 meters, if I was training for 2000, just because, you know, my splits are 118 instead of, you know, mm. a, a 133 or something like that. But it's been, it's been interesting. And, and even the foot stretcher position and kind of, you know, when I'm doing anything and kind of in the longer, you know, 500 meter above kind of keeping those feet so I can get, make sure I'm comfortable with a full, full stroke. Whereas if I'm getting shorter, you know, those full strokes aren't as necessary, you know, and the, and the one minute I haven't experimented it as much because it's, it's right on that borderline I've found between raising the heels and getting a little bit more direct power application, but also the limitations in terms of being comfortable in those full, mm -hmm. full strokes and full compression, whereas the hundred meters, no doubt you want to lift those, those heels because you're not going to be taking full strokes anyway, and you want that additional leverage. How much, how much of a difference do you feel between like the static rower and the dynamic? Oh, or when I, you're on slides like it's for me it's night and day and i don't i don't do too much on the indoor just because it's not as fun for me you know because the the on the slides just feels like on the water rowing and that's that's yeah. where my love of the motion came from um and so you know mainly because on the slides you're moving the erg you know and you know your body is not moving back and forth so it's a very different dynamic you know do you um, find then then like drags are different too um, not so much, not so much. Oh. I, I do find that I think a lot of people try to try to say that, you know, you can go faster on the slides, but I've actually found that the, the more experienced you are as a rower, the less the difference between the, the slides and the, on, in the indoor rower. For instance, okay. like I, my, my best time on the indoor rower is only a meter slower than my world record on the, on the slides, you know? And so, and, and when I did it on the indoor, I actually, I was training a lot less. I just kind of hopped on one day and just kind of did it um, for an indoor race locally. But, uh, and so I don't, I don't think there's a huge difference there in terms of the performance, but the feel is totally different, especially maybe less so for things like a thousand and 2000 meters. But when you start getting into that 500 meters, and certainly if you're getting to 100 meters where, you're, where your stroke rate is getting above generally about a, a 37, 38, when you start getting above kind of those high 30s on the stroke rates, you're just, you're, there's no way to really be relaxed and passive in terms of moving your body back and forth. You have to actually start to pull your body forward to get the mm -hmm. rate up high enough on a stationary erg. Um, and so you're going to lose energy. So I do think, you know, that, you know, and when you jack up and you're going to hundred meters, you know, anything on the slide should be potentially faster than on the stationary because you should be able to move your body more effectively at those high rates. You know, so, I mean, I think I was hitting like a 68 or something, you know, when I did my hundred meter piece. Um, and I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't do that on a stationary erg. I would look like I was having a seizure. <laughs> right. Big. And yeah. And so, but, but it's interesting and kind of where that transition is happening. And, um, and for, you know, I, I don't think I would for the, I think the transition for me would be between the 500 and the 1000, um, in terms of, you know, I would notice a significantly better 
performance on that 500 or faster because I could use those slides to effectively mm -hmm. get that rate up and I could do my, like I do it like for my one minute, I think, you know, average on my, the record that I have posted, I think my average is actually fairly low is maybe only like 43, 44. Whereas if I was kind of really, you know, having a great day, I think I'd be hitting about 48, um, you know, for my stroke rate on that. And for 500, I'd probably be bouncing around a 44, 45, maybe 46. Um, whereas, you know, once I get to a thousand meters, you know, even on the slides that, that rates, that ideal rate would probably be around a 38, 40. So it would still be in that place where I could transition onto the stationary and still be moving yeah. with that same cadence. Um, and therefore, and for me, the, the speed is related to the cadence. And so, the dynamic on for the stroke itself is going to be the same whether I'm on the indoor rower or whether I'm on the indoor row on slides. And so it's just a matter of am I am I able to effectively get the rate up uh, using the 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 tools, using the machine, and the, 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 how the machine is designed versus actually pulling my my weight forward, which I need to do on the indoor rower. Okay, but, I need to try some slides. Yeah, it's 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 fun, you know. A, a, a to to the T, whenever I put my rowers uh, on them for the first time, it's 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 ninety percent, and I kind of usually write write a note uh, on a whiteboard, and I don't show them till after. And I, on the board, I say, "You're gonna say this feels weird," and like every and eighty percent of them, uh, like they're like, "This feels weird," and I was like, "Yep, yep, it does." Um, and especially, I think for people, you know, if you're coming from like your perspective with the indoor rower, where you've never been on the water where the system does move under you, um, you know, it probably will feel weird. And I, uh, you know, for me, I, I think slides are used a little in, in inappropriately in the sport. I think they're used kind of almost to, to fix problems where sometimes that will magnify technical problems. Uh, but in terms of moving, if you're doing it right, it, it feels good. You know, it's, uh, you know, you really, you let the or come up and on the end of row, you're, you're moving yourself forward, right? And you're, you're getting into a good position and you've got to, you've got to stop you know, turn that momentum, uh, the direction of the momentum at the front end on the slides, it's really, I compare it to kind of like being a free fall and then, and then pulling your parachute cord. Um, you know, you should really feel like you're kind of in a free fall coming into the front end and then you pull that cord. And so you're waiting to push instead of timing the push. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and you can definitely move quicker, you know, if you're doing it right. It's, uh, you, can, you can cause problems if you're doing it wrong, but, uh, but it's fun. It feels good. It's a lot more passive. Um, so I don't feel like I'm having a seizure if I'm doing the sprint work. It's, it's, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there's some pretty ugly uh, sprint technique out there. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you see it certainly on the 100 meters where you don't need, you don't need a rowing uh, a base, but uh, you see that, you know, the big strong men hop on that the, <laughs> and pull some yep. crazy splits. Yep. But uh, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, you know, Tyson Witt is the, is the guy that holds the, uh, the, a lot of the records in the next age group up, which are actually faster than the age group that I kind of set mine in. And, and those were actually my, my goals of trying to kind of get you got some work. I do. I do. And unfortunately, I've been seduced by, by trail running lately. So uh, that's, that's where fine. all my, my training's been. But uh, you have a whole, I, how old are you now? I've got, I've got seven weeks before I age out. So where, where Tyson is my, is my new target, but uh, okay. I'll probably, I'll hop on the erg and I'll, 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 cause I know I can improve those records before, before I turn 40. So we'll, we'll do that, but it's been cool. fun. Um, tell me a little bit, or actually I do want to go back. You had, you had talked about these competitions and I thought it was really cool and kind of how they're set up. And so let's, let's use kind of the, just, you know, a distance, you were talking about the thousand meters and then 750, 500, 200, and then how the overall and then the thousand and then what was it, the 250 were, were, were yeah. counted for points. All right, take, take me through that a little bit and kind of, you know, and just kind of when you're looking at that, kind of how you kind of pace it, because that sounds fun, you know, because you can't just go full out you know, on each one, right? If you're, if you're trying to, you know, achieve multiple. The fun version was when they, when they, when they flipped that. That was different. The 250 was first mm. in score oh. seven. So you're in a <laughs> deficit from the beginning. Mm, yeah. um, obviously, the more you train mm -hmm. like that, which is why a lot of what we do is kind of similar, um, the more familiar you are with how you can, can pace that. So, you know, in our world, we kind of relate everything to, to 2K pace roughly. Um, and, you know, in that workout, if, if there were no, if you were just doing the workout by itself, you'd probably start the 1K at around 2K pace, the 750 be a little bit quicker and to sort of build speed throughout. But when you're starting to think about, okay, I need to maximize my thousand meter time, but not crush myself that I can't then. Because um, how much, how much rest was it between 
the one K and the seven fifty. Two minute, two oh, minute yeah. ninety second minute, <laughs> okay. or it might even been minute thirty minute thirty second. It was something like it was it was descending. I forget what it was, but it wasn't a lot. It was mm. it was it was cut down. Um, if you know yourself well, like personally, I know if I can hold, um, you know, maybe just under two K pace. So I, you know, in that one, if I'm like, okay, if I can be around one twenty seven to one twenty eight split for this 1K, I know I can hold close to 130 for the 750, probably dip under for the 500. And then with a 250, I mean, you're already, you're almost done. You can suffer for 40, 45 seconds. Right. And it is what it is. Um, at that point, you're just counting strokes and praying. Um, but again, you're, you're trying to balance your output. You have to be considerate of the fact that you might have to do that workout again in a day or two. And you need to sort of play the leaderboard a little bit. So um, when points matter, you might need to, you know, let off the gas on the thousand to be more competitive in the 250 at the end. Like if you're not a good sprinter and you need to make up the most points to close gaps at that, you need to be willing to sort of sacrifice points at the top end. So um, there is a lot of tactic happening. Uh, you can't simply um, try and smash. Like I've, I've seen guys come in who are very, very good rowers who don't necessarily play to the leaderboard and their scores suffer as a result. And, you know, the, the leaderboard is not necessarily indicative of ability, but it's definitely, you know, favors those who know how to game it very well. Um, and that's sort of the, the fun part of it. Um, because now, are there can, other weight classes there too? Because as a lightweight, I'm kind of like the, the idea of the virtual indoor doesn't so appeal. Road, road royalty goes by height. Okay. They have a 5'11 and under. And then it was like 5'11 and over and then 5'10 and down. Um, I'm guessing they did that because the thinking when they started was, taller people are better at rowing so, <laughs> they were um, but no there i think there are some competitions popping up where at least in rowing where lightweight heavyweight um there's one i think going on right now they might even be a middleweight category that is sort of created for that competition um because there's obviously you know there's a difference between what heavyweights even like heavyweights that don't have a lot of rowing experience can pull relative to, you know, even an experienced lightweight, especially at yeah. shorter distances, they can get pretty lucky. Yeah. Um, there's nothing in the skier world because there's nothing in the cross country world in terms mm -hmm. of lightweight or heavyweight and cycling is cycling. Yeah. Well, see, I mean the, um, you know, between cycling and, and skiing, I mean, those are more muscular endurance sports than rowing. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that, and I, I had a commenter ask me about this on, on the YouTube channel and I was going to make a video about it. He asked me to talk about kind of my, my thoughts on the value of, of light rate rowing. And he was talking about flyweight even as a category and kind of what my perspective was and, and row, lightweight rowing has been certainly under fire, you know, forever and, and more so now than ever, um, you know, at the Olympic stage and beyond. But I, I my, my response is that I, I think any sport, that uh, that involves where muscular strength and power is a big component um, needs to have the weight classes because a as you mentioned you can you can have a very poor uh, rower who's just bigger who is going to outperform a, a far more skilled uh, smaller rower and same thing in sure. boxing and, and powerlifting and, and weightlifting you know anything where you're bringing the strength component in um, the size of the athlete matters whereas it's less so in, in like a track and field. Um, you know, where, um, you know, you just, the running is going to create the body that you need regardless. Uh, you're not going to have a 220 pound, you know, distance runner. Yep. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that, that's interesting there. And then, and the, for, I know you through garage athlete and through your own channel, you're working on kind of creating your own kind of virtual championship. You know, what's uh, Tell me a little bit about kind of your thinking and kind of what you guys are trying to do with that. Yeah. In the works, hopefully, uh, hopefully end of November, that'll happen. Um, so there's not currently one that uses all three ergs. There's been a lot of indoor rowing ones for years. Um, there's been a couple on the ski erg. Now this is separate from like the challenges that Concept2 puts out. Like in the Concept2 challenge calendar, you have uh, the virtual sprints in March. That's a 1,000 meter row. You have um, the 
biker sprints in July. That's a 4K bike, not a sprint. They need to change that name. And then uh, in November, it's the skier uh, sprints, and that's a 1,000 meter as well. So that's the Concept 2 calendar. Um, and then obviously road royalty is the sort of the big prize money one for indoor rowing, and that's in usually December, January, um, which has attracted some more, you know, world class rowers because, you know, if you can win over a thousand dollars, it's kind of big money for, for a competition. The trick, the trick with that one, it's, it's right kind of in the smack middle of, of, uh, like Elite the cycle. indoor rowing championships, like the, mm. the in-person arena ones. Yeah. Um, worlds in February, various countries are, are running theirs from December to February and so on. So, um, but that's, I think that's going to get more popular as, as the prize money goes up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to have a lot of big name guys getting in. Our competition is going to use all three. So we're really catering to, um, you know, the multi-erg folks who may or may not have access to them at gyms, have them at homes. Um, what we want to do is have, you know, a balanced competition, three events per week, one on each machine for three weeks. So nine total events. Um, and then within that week, you know, um, personally, I wouldn't want to have like three miserable sessions in a week on each machine. If I was just training, I'd want some balance. So our, our, our programming will, will try and mimic that where we have a little bit of balanced exposure. You know, you could almost say, okay, there's probably going to be a long ski. There's probably going to be a middle distance or interval ski, and there's probably going to be a short one. And same thing on the rower and the bike. And our goal is just to, to crown, you know, the best across all three ergs. Gotcha. So hopefully, hopefully that happens. We're, uh, we're yeah. kind of mapping that out and trying to get that set for, for November, end of November, and then maybe moving it to, um, to the summer next year. And for, and for on the water rowers who kind of aren't, aren't so familiar with kind of the, just the indoor rowing community and the, the circuit, where can they be finding all these, the, these variety of indoor rowing competition just to kind of keep things interesting for themselves so, while they're confined to land? Thanks to social media. Um, I think the easiest place would be, you know, there's a lot of Facebook groups. There's a concept to logbook group. There's a concept to community group on Facebook and you have, you know, thousands of people who, are asking questions and posting screenshots and, and, you know, posting links to articles and stuff every day. Um, there's a ton of, uh, Instagrammers out there that are, you know, a lot like us in terms of training and whatnot. Um, I'm trying to think of like specific or specific websites. Cause I know some people have, um, you know, websites devoted to, the, the concept to sort of training calendar and competitions that pop up. Um, the big team one, the, the concept to cross team challenge. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. No. Um, and if you're not consider this an invite, you could always use a good lightweight. All right, <laughs> all right. it. it's, a, it's a monthly challenge. It's team based. So you're basically filling these virtual boats with uh, three heavyweights, a lightweight and a female. Okay. And, um, you know, the lead, there's, there's Olympians in it, there's casual rowers, there's, you know, hardcore at home, sort of semi-competitive. It's kind of like adult volleyball league, or like, it's like a men's league. Like if you played men's league basketball or, or volleyball or whatever, it's yeah. basically that with a leaderboard and some, you know, some top end quality athletes. So um, it's, it's more about having a good group of rowers come together to fill a boat to, to do well on the leaderboard than it is about, your sort of individual score but every month is different each team chooses like uh, every month a new team will choose um, that month's challenge so this month is a four by 505 meter on two minutes rest but your slowest rep counts okay so in terms of pacing you got to be smart about you know coming out too hot because if your last one's you know eight splits slower because you're crushed All right, that's right, your yeah. score for the workout so um that's this particular challenge they've had longer ones they've had rate capped efforts previously before so every month's a little bit different um and it's just, it's just something fun for you know people that sort of work towards 
every month. You just need one workout a month that you can do and your score would help, you know, float a boat awesome. for, for that team. Yeah. Once, so uh, once it starts to get too cold for me to, to be running again and I should cover, up, I'll, 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 I'll connect with you. Yeah. I'll cool. actually, I have to get my, my endurance, uh, rowing legs back under me. It's funny how I can go for a 50 minute run, but for me right now, it's like 10 minutes on the air. is it's excruciating. <laughs> Very specific. I can't um, run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It's uh, it takes, it takes about two months for me, for me, my endurance rowing to kind of kick back in and be like, Oh, this is what we're doing now. We're not sprinting anymore, but it's, uh, it's funny. And it's, it's interesting too. And kind of going back to that that sprinting side how like you know at those high-end sprints you know doing endurance work is counter actually counterproductive you know to where you know you'll never see you'll never see a 400 meter sprinter you know doing more than you know a three mile run and so for me it's like well i you know i don't uh you know i'm kind of like going against you know my my goals if i'm sitting down yeah. for even a 30 minute steady state sometimes you just gotta train like a decathlete yeah yeah right there you go. <laughs> bruce slash caitlin jenner there perfect uh, you know kind of get it out there well, awesome. This has been a ton of fun, you know, conversation here, uh, Justin. And so, uh, so yeah, so I've learned a lot and, uh, you know, maybe got a new uh, indoor rowing team kind of when I hop back into things. It's going to uh, happen. But, uh, awesome. you know, so for people out there, you know, they can find uh, Justin Garage Athlete on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and your website, Garage Athlete. Uh, any other places that people can find you or maybe connect with your, your virtual championship that they want to hop in on that action? Yeah, garageathletefitness.com. And then um, there's links to that stuff. Uh, the competition's going to be exclusively on an app called ErgZone, okay. which is still in beta, but uh, um, they're planning on launching soon. And it's sort of um, they've been in development for a little over a year and mm -hmm. the events will be posted there. They'll it'll program the monitor for you. It'll update the leaderboard automatically. So, um, you know, really cool feature with that app, but um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it happens. Hopefully awesome. It happens. Awesome. Yeah. And people, people that don't, that I know some people may follow a rowing resource, but they don't follow me personally, but you know, you can kind of find my kind of individual work on GTS rowing or, or just search my name on YouTube at uh, Travis Gardner and I, do a lot of kind of lecture style training talks there. I always get people saying, "No, oh, we want this, we want these shorter." And I'm like, "No, I want people that are willing to kind of chew on the chew on the you know the fat and and kind of." Get I've uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed you know peeling potatoes in the morning and putting on you know your latest talk or awesome, awesome. trying to listen to it and dealing with kids or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's been great. My YouTube fell apart. I was trying to get into the habit of it. And then uh, our computer crashed along with like, I had three videos in the queue ready to go. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll screw this. I'm, yeah. I'm I, I had the exact same experience. I, I was like, I got into my, like my training blog I was going to do. I think it was around this time last year. I got like 12 in and then I had the, like the epic computer crash. And then the, the nightmare three and a half months of, of customer service with Lenovo before they finally, I was finally just like, you're sending me a replacement. You've sent me three, fixed uh machines that don't work and then you so that that killed it and then i was kind of killed the killed the youtube until uh i think it was around april i was just like i can't coach i can't do anything i'm just gonna talk to a, a camera and educate the community and then the community loved you it. got so, momentum Keep and i've been going. having fun you know so it's been good but uh but yeah so awesome uh well i appreciate justin and and we'll definitely kind of you know keep in touch and uh and uh, yeah, keep on, keep on pulling those in. And next target is 9,000 meters for 30 minutes. That's kind of your next big goal. That's the goal. Yesterday, six by five though. <laughs> six by five minute kind of wrecked me. I came, uh, out, uh, came out on target and just quickly realized that this is yeah. not, I'm either going to quit or <laughs> slow down. So, so we'll see, we'll cool. see. Well, I'll be rooting for you. Awesome. Appreciate it. Well, thanks Justin. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sign off there. Great, thanks Trev. No problem.